Have I missed anything? Any more notices? No. Okay. Um, Steve, would you come and pray for our preacher? <laughs> Which so we're carrying on Joshua, Mark. We're in Joshua seven. So Mark is our speaker for this morning. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, Father, thank you so much for Mark, Lord, and uh, we thank you for his heart and his um, the, the urgency with which he seeks you, Lord. And we just pray, Lord, that we would catch some of that. Help us to hear what you're saying to us individually, Lord. Um, yeah, would you anoint him and also anoint us to hear what you want to say to each of us in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Good, I got a little bit longer than the normal because I'm going to need it this morning. Welcome if you're new here. If it's the first time you've, you've, you've come to River Church, you are most welcome. As Laura said, we are in the process of going through uh, the book of Joshua. The book of Joshua is found in the, in the Old Testament. It's quite early on. Um, and, and the whole, the, the serious title for the entire of Joshua is Taking the Land. And those of you who were here last week, wasn't it so good? Wasn't Sue just on the ball, on the money? And if you weren't here last week, I think it was recorded. And at some point, I'm looking to Tom, at some point in the very near future, it'll be available to re-listen to or listen to for the first time. Certainly, I am going to, as soon as that's up, I'm going to be listening to that again. Um, because there were some gems in there just to encourage us and to build us up and to give us faith. I said to Sue last week, I said, thanks for that. Thanks for that. i got to follow that. Because my passage at first thought is not quite as upbeat, is not quite as encouraging. Mine, my passage in the New Testament is entitled, A Can Sin. My word. Thanks for that. But... God has something amazing that he wants to share with each of us. And it absolutely is encouraging. Laura touched on it earlier about God's promises and breakthrough. And so I've changed the title of this talk from Achan Sin to God's promises and God's breakthrough. Because there is breakthrough. So, so who has ever received a promise from God? Excellent. Who has received a promise from God and just feels like maybe God's forgotten it? Maybe God's like, ah, uh, yeah, but you missed it. How many of us need, feel like we just need a breakthrough, whether that's receiving a promise from God, the promise that he's given us, or just a breakthrough in life? Excellent. Good. Most people put their hand up at some point in those questions. So, Listen to the entirety of this message. There'll be something in there for you that will give you hope and will speak life back into where you need breakthrough, where you need the, the promises um, to come back into, into being. So just to give us a bit of background, Joshua 1 verse 3, right at the beginning, God says to Joshua, I will give you every place where you set your foot as I promised Moses. Joshua heard a promise, a promise from the Lord that every land, he, every place he put his foot, he would take the land. Joshua 1, 6 and 9, again, God says, be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land as I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Again, he says, be careful to obey all of the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn to it from the left or to the right, that you may be successful wherever you go. If you keep this book of the law always on your lips, meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it, then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord, your God, will be with you wherever you go. That the promises from the Lord to Joshua right at the very beginning of, of his journey of, of taking the land. Four or five times in those few passages, God says the same thing. He says, be strong, be courageous, I will be with you. As a word for someone today, be strong, be courageous, because he is with you. But did you notice the if and then? 
if you do this, then. Many of you who, who know mine and, and Laura's story know that we lived in uh, Malawi for about three and a half, four years. Um, and Laura shared some of it when she was, when she was um, talking. But, so I want to share a little bit of that same story. So God called us to Malawi and we'd sold a house. We'd sold a house before it went on the market. We broke the ceiling price of the road of the house. I was literally about to hand in my notice at work. So all was going great, all was going fantastic. Then, there's always a then, isn't there? Then, the door that had been opened up to us literally slammed in our faces. So hard, it almost broke my nose. Seriously, it was, it was like that. We were like, what is going on? Everything was going so well. Clearly, the Lord's in this. You know, we've sold a house. It's not even on the market, and we've sold it for more than anyone has ever sold, sold a house on that road before. In fact, one of these said, it says, there's no way you'll get that much. No house on this road has ever sold for that value. It sold for the value that it was on the market for. We had to hold on to God's promises. We knew God had called us and God was promising us to, take, to be able to move into Malawi. The next day, I was in time of worship and, and I had this amazing vision of, um, of a boxing match between two angels. One was dressed in black and the other one was dressed in white. And it, this boxing match was very even, very, very even. The, I should say, if you hadn't clocked on, the one dressed in black was not fighting for us. The one dressed in white was, but the match was even. It was blow for blow. And then all of a sudden I saw this white horse come into the picture with someone riding the white horse. <laughs> Every time. And God, so Jesus was on that white horse, white horse and he got off the white horse. And the scene changed to the angel dressed in black, sprawled out on the floor with Jesus' foot on his back like that, in a victory stance. I knew, I knew without a shadow of a doubt that we would be moving to Malawi and things would be okay. I didn't have a clue how, I just knew. I just knew you could have told me you've got no chance. I said, yes, there is a chance. I had hope because of what Jesus had shown me. I didn't understand how it was going to work out, but I knew it was going to work out. God can be dependent. He's dependable. If he's given you a promise, he's dependable. And God did miraculously open the door. He did miraculously open, door, open the door. Laura shared that in when she was talking. So last week, Sue was talking from Joshua 6, where, where, where the Israelites and Joshua took the land of Jericho. It was the land that was all shut up. It was the land that, quite frankly, Jericho and Israelites had no business whatsoever attacking because they had no chance. And they took the land. So they were buoyed, they were encouraged, they were built up by this. Joshua 7, 4 to 5, it says, so about 3,000 men went up but they were routed by the men of Ai, or Ai, however you want to pronounce it. And the men of Ai killed about 36 of them. They chased the Israelites from the city gate as far as the stone quarries and struck them down on the slopes. At this, the hearts of the Israelites melted in fear and became like water. Hang on a minute. Hadn't God spoken to Joshua that you'll take the land? Didn't God say, be strong and courageous, for I will be with you? And they saw that in Joshua 6. But all of a sudden in Joshua 7, they're being defeated. 
the Israelites, the same army who just taken Jericho, are now melting in fear. What went wrong? What has gone wrong? God has promised the land, so what went wrong? The problem was, I think two things. Number one, Israel did exactly the same as they did in Jericho. They spied out the land. And, and they, knew, they, knew, they knew what the enemy was all about. But, but, and we'll see in a bit the difference, but the people spying out the land said, ah, oh, these guys, they're easy. We can take them, no problem. We don't need our entire army. We can do it with three or 4,000 men. We'll be good. They're wimps. You know, we've just taken Jericho. God's going to be with us. It's all good. They thought they could do it in their own strength. They relied on themselves. They didn't listen to God. You see, what worked once doesn't always mean he'll do it the same again the second time around. They were encouraged by their previous success, but that was their downfall. Sue reminded us last week that the battle is not ours. How often do we forget that the battle is not ours, especially when we've had a victory? Especially when we've had a breakthrough. It's the sense of, I'll do it my way. How often have we thought, I'll just do it my way? How often have we thought, do you know what? God's not quite got it to plan. His promises haven't quite come to fruition. So I'll help him out. I'll do it my way. I, I put my hand up to that. I'll do it my way. God's not quick enough. You see, often, you know that little word that's called, that's used quite a lot, that S-I-N word, that sin word? There's a little letter in the middle of that word called, and it's I. And too often, it's the I in the middle that becomes the problem. Because it becomes about us. We forget that actually it's because of God and, it, and we can only do things and have breakthrough because of what God is doing. So more of our story of moving to Malawi. Um, Laura, Laura, Laura went to London to, to meet some people and um, met, met someone who was running a project in Blantyre, which is on the south of the city. We'd only ever lived or, or visited Lilongwe, which is about five hours north. And we knew nobody in Blantyre at all. And, and we thought we were going to Lilongwe, okay? And so Laura was talking to this person who'd invited basically Laura to come and, and be part of what's going on in Blantyre. And Laura said, no, we're going to Lilongwe. God's called us to Lilongwe. To cut a long story short, in the week leading up to that, we were still looking for this breakthrough, but I knew God was going to do it. But in the week leading up to Laura going to, to London, I... Um, I really felt like God say to me, hang on, Mark, when I called you, did I call you to Malawi or did I call you to Lilongwe? And I, um, I confessed, I said, yeah, you did. You called us to Malawi, not Lilongwe. You see, we'd had it in our heads that we had contacts in Lilongwe, therefore we would live in Lilongwe. We knew Lilongwe, it would be all good. We knew nobody in Blantyre or anywhere else, quite frankly. So why on earth would God call us to somewhere that we'd never even been? A city we, we knew nothing about. God called us to Malawi, not the long way. Anyway, we, we held our hands up, said, yes, God. And, and he opened the door miraculously for us to be able to live in Blantyre. When we touched down in Blantyre, literally, we knew nobody. We'd met two people for about half an hour, 
and that was it. We knew nobody. One of, the, one of the other things God said to us as we were moving out, he said, don't do any ministry until I tell you. I know we've been living in, in Malawi about, about this time, about three, three months, four months, something like that. And we've been diligent, but God wasn't opening up any, any doors. And we were having a conversation with the leaders of the Y1 base um, in Blanta. And they gave us an opportunity. They said, you guys would be great doing this. You should come along. You should do some teaching. You should do some ministry. We've got a load of people who'd really love to, to hear, hear, hear what you're carrying, what you bring. Um, and we said, yeah, that sounds really good. That sounds great. Yeah. They went home. We went home. And God was like, Mark, Mark. Yes, God. What did I say? What do you mean, what did you say? What did I say about ministry? He said, oh, yes. You said, don't do anything until you say so. Ah. But God, we've given our yes. God said, yeah, but I said, don't do anything until I tell you to. Uh, so we had to ring these new friends, these new contacts, and say, I'm really sorry. But God said, no, we're not to do what you've asked us to do. We did do some stuff with YOM later on, but that wasn't the essence of what we were doing. See, I tried to figure it out our way. I tried to do it my way. We tried to do it our way because God, you know, taken three months, nothing was happening. So the Israelites tried to do it their way, but then we've got something quite specific. We've got Achan's sin of disobedience. Joshua 6, verse 18. The Lord says, but keep, this is, this is uh, an instruction about what they're to do when they take Jericho. God says, but keep away from the devoted things so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise, you will make the camp of Israel liable to destruction. Keep away from the devoted things. That was the instruction from the Lord. But what happened? Joshua 7 verse 1. But the Israelites were unfaithful in regard to the devoted things. Achan, son of Carmi, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah, the tribe of Judah, took some of them. So the Lord's anger burned against them. So they had a specific instruction from the Lord about what not to do with the stuff of Jericho. And yet they did exactly the opposite. The Israelites acted unfaithfully towards the devoted things. Achan, in essence, thought, ah, do you know what? A few things can't hurt. Who's going to know? A little bit of gold here, a little bit of silver here, a little bit of valuable here. Again, he had the sense of, I'll do it my way. A little bit won't hurt. It reminds me of the story in Acts of Ananias and Sapphira. We all know that story where literally Ananias and Sapphira stole from God. They disobeyed the Lord. And we know the story. They were killed by God. I'm not saying that happens. Please hear me. I did not say that happens all the while. So I want to ask, the promises that God has given you, the breakthrough that you've been looking for, maybe for, for weeks, months, maybe even years, is there something stopping your breakthrough? It might not be disobedience. It might not be, I'll do it my way. It might simply be a bit hesitant. Oh, well, oh, I don't know. Oh, can I? Can I do this? It might be fear. It might be that it's been going on, you've been waiting so long that you've just become despondent. You've just lost hope. You know, yesterday, um, someone spoke a word over, a prophetic word over Laura and I. 
and it was so powerful. It was so good. I really sensed the Lord on it. But do you know what happened? As that word was being spoken and my spirit was being lifted, my mind was like, mm, I'm not sure I really want to believe it. It's been so long, I'm not sure I really want to believe it. What happens if it's wrong? I don't want to get disappointed. And God reminded me of the passage in the New Testament where, where the guy says to Jesus, I believe, just help my unbelief. And I really felt that the Lord was saying, it's okay. It's okay to have some doubt. It's absolutely okay. He said, I felt like he said, I can do it. I can do it with what you have. You've got faith. You believe I can do it. You just need more faith to trust that I will do it. Sometimes people's breakthrough don't come because of un un unforgiveness. That might sound odd. That might sound weird. Uh, it's been used recently, I believe, this, this phrase. Someone once said that unforgiveness is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. I've, I've had the privilege so often, Law and I lead the ministry, uh, the, the Sozo uh, um, here in, in, in the church. And I've had the privilege so often of leading people through a level of forgiveness. Sometimes it is just a process that I choose to forgive them today. Then I choose to forgive them tomorrow. But whether it's a process or whether it happens there and then, as we go through that process around forgiving, because we felt so hurt, so, so used by, by the person that we need to forgive, we struggle to be able to forgive. And what that does, that holds us, holds us in the prison rather than the prison that we're trying to hold them in because they deserve it too often but I've had the privilege of leading people through this and as they've as they've said forgiven the person as they've forgiven the person then something happens then a breakthrough comes it could be it could be sometimes I've seen it instantly there and then sometimes it's been a day or two later we've had a testimony said Do you know what forgiven that person and I've continued to forgive that person and now I'm beginning to see the breakthrough that I, that I wanted to see that, I, that that's why I came for the Sozo 4 sometimes our own unforgiveness holds our own breakthrough from coming of course it might be as simple it might be as simple as God just wanting to teach us something of who he is I want to ask us a question. Are we listening and leaning into him? Which brings me on to my next point. Seek him. So the Israelites have been defeated by the people of Ai. 36 of them died. They were all full of fear. And Joshua was like, right. I need to do something about this. What is, what can I do? I know what I'll do. I'll go back to God. I'll go back to him and ask him. So Joshua 7, 6 to 9. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell face down to the ground before the ark of the Lord, remaining there till evening. The elders of Israel did the same and sprinkled dust on their heads. And Joshua said, this is really real prayer from Joshua. Alas, sovereign Lord, why did you ever bring this people across the Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? If only we had been content to stay on the other side of the Jordan. Pardon your servant, Lord. What can I say? Now that Israel has been routed by its enemies, the Canaanites and the other people of the country will hear about this and they will surround us and wipe us out and our name from the earth. What then will you do for your own great name? Do you ever feel like praying a prayer like that? 
What are you doing, God? What are you doing? It's all gone horribly wrong. God, God can handle that kind of prayer. It's all good. It's all good. Josh, Joshua was real. He asked the Lord. But he, see, Joshua had a history with God that told him there must be something else going on. If God has promised something and it's not happened here, so God promised you can take the land and they lost, there must be something else going on. And Joshua had a history with God that says, if I come before him, if I inquire of him, he will speak to me. He will show me what the solution is. He will show me what the problem is. Joshua had that history. It taught him that God is faithful. You see, God had promised, therefore something else must be going on. You see, God does not, and he did not, break his promises. He's never, ever, ever broken any one of his promises. 1 Thessalonians 5, 20, 24 says this, The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Do you need to know that the Lord is faithful to what he's called you for, for the breakthrough that he's promised you? Do you need to know he's faithful? He'll do it. As a statement, the one who calls you is faithful, he will do it. We all know the story of Abraham and Isaac. Abraham was 99 years old. About 23, 24 years before that, he received a promise from God that, that, that he would become the father of, of many nations. He had no kids at the time. He was 99 years old when when, 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 or 100 years old, when he finally had a child. Added to that, Sarah, his wife, was barren. So literally, there was no chance. Not a chance on this planet. And yet, in Romans 4, 20 to 21, Paul says, regarding Abraham, he did not waver in unbelief regarding the promise of God but was fully persuaded that God had power to do what he promised. God has power to do what he promised. Have you been waiting 25 years for something to come about? Did, did God promise you something 25 years ago? Maybe he promised you something 25 months ago, maybe even 25 days ago, and you've all been like, what are you doing, God? Where, what, what's happening? It's not happening. Why? What's going on? For Abraham, everything was going against him, literally everything. His age, the, the state of his wife, who was also old, by the way. I think she was about 90. You see, keeps, I want to encourage us to keep sight of the promises that God has given you. And they, the promises he's given you, will keep you anchored to him. I'll say that again. Keep sight of the promises of God he's given you because they will keep you anchored to him. What does your history with God teach you? Does your history with God say, hang on a minute, I have this story where, where God broke out and God, God came through in a promise 30 years ago, however long ago it was. We all have a history, we all have a, have a history with God that can teach us that we can continue to look to him, we can continue to trust him. I want to encourage us to look back on the things that God has done. Because you see, what he did in the past is meant to, meant to be our flaw now. What he did in the past is meant to be our flaw now. It's, that flaw is our launching pad. It's meant to spur us on. 
It's meant to move us to the next level. You see, God is never, ever wanting us to go backwards. He always wants us to go forward. So keep hold of those promises. And let those promises and let what he's done in the past be enough to take you up to the next step. So Joshua had inquired of the Lord. Notice the Lord's response. I think too often people become down on themselves and think, oh, God could never. It's too late. I've done this or I've done that or I've tried to do it my way. And, you know, notice the Lord's response. God doesn't say, ah, Joshua, sorry, son, you've blown it. You tried to do it your way. You disobeyed me. Too bad, mate. My promise is broken. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna fulfil that anymore. God didn't say that. God didn't say I will no longer keep my promise to you. No, God gave Joshua the solution. He showed Joshua why the battle of I hadn't been won. Joshua seven ten to fifteen says, the Lord said to Joshua, stand up. What are you doing down on your face? Israel has sinned. They violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They've taken some of the devoted things. They've stolen, they've lied, and they've put them with their own possessions. That is why the Israelites can't stand against your enemies. They turn their backs and run because they have been made liable to destruction. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. Go consecrate the people. Tell them, consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. There are devoted things among you, Israel. You cannot stand against your enemies until you remove them. And then they go on and do that. I will not be with you anymore unless... Sometimes the Lord just wants to, wants us to come to him in order that we hear from him what we need to do. It might not be that we've got, you know, that we're into all sorts of deep and dark and horrible stuff. As I said earlier, it might simply be that we become despondent. We become fearful. As I said earlier, the story of, of, our, of, our, of Malawi and, and Waiwam, he had to, had to say no. As I said, he reminded us of what he'd said. And so we had to go back to the leaders of Waiwam and say, sorry, that's not for us. But the problem is, if we stick to, to Josh, just Joshua 7, we can get disheartened. But there is more to the story. Sadly, when the Bible was written, someone in the infinite wisdom decided to put chapter breaks and verses and all sorts of stuff in it. And so if we stop at chapter 7, which I'm supposed to do, but I've told Nigel who's preaching next week, I'm not. I've got to move into chapter 8 to give us a hope. If we read chapter 7 alone, we get so despondent. So Joshua 8, verse 1. Remember, remember the Israelites had been defeated by Ai. They're full of fear. Joshua has come to the Lord. The Lord spoke unto him and said, let's just do this. This is what, you know, you, you've been doing that and I told you not to. Joshua 8. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Take the whole army with you and go up and attack Ai. For I have delivered you into the hands of the king of Ai, his people, his city, and his land. So again, God says, I will be with you. Notice before, in the first first little bit of chapter 7, the spies went up and they spied the land and said, oh, we can do this with 3,000 people. Yeah? I do it my way. 
What does God say to do in chapter 8? Take the entire army with you. That was about 10 times as many people, 30 to 40,000 people. And as we'll find out next week, that the Israelites and Joshua, they followed God's instructions. They got rid of the devoted things. They took the entire army up. They were back in trusting the Lord, trusting in his word. And what happens? Success! Breakthrough! Where they'd previously lost to this, this tiny city of Ai. They were now having success and breakthrough. You see, our breakthrough can come in varying forms. I want to encourage us to position ourselves at his feet. Just like Joshua did. It's not going to plan. Come back to the feet of Jesus. What does your history with God tell you about him? Does it tell you he's faithful? Is there something in your life that you can say, do you know what, God did it then, he could do it now. If not, find somebody else's story and use that for you. Because what's true of them is true of you. And it's not about my way. It's about him and his way and what he's saying. I want to encourage you to hold on to those promises. Hold on to those promises, no matter how long ago they were. God is not limited by time. Hold on to those promises. But also, just lean into him, because sometimes the breakthrough is delayed because he wants to show us something about us. He wants to show us something about of who he is. As many of you know, Laura and I are living by faith. And at the moment, we're living on savings. Right at the beginning, God spoke to me quite clearly. He said, it's easy to live by faith when you have some money in the bank. You're right. Obviously, he's right. Is absolutely right. As the savings are becoming more and more depleted, all of a sudden, it's not quite so easy. What am I learning? What am I learning from God in this season? Keep on listening to him. So our story of Malawi, we'd, we'd said no to, to YWAM. We said that's not what God has for us. About... Four to six weeks later, God opened up the door to, to another ministry we didn't really know too much about at all. And it was absolutely the right fit. When, when we were introduced to this, this organization, we just knew in our spirits that this was a yes. And wow, what an amazing, what God did through that was absolutely fantastic. You see, God's work, God done God's way, never fails. Whatever appears to be holding up your breakthrough. I'm going to share this. I question whether I will, but I will. So whatever appears to be holding up your breakthrough, I felt like Jesus was saying, he wants to love it out of you. I felt like he was saying, the enemy has been lying to you when he says, you've blown it. I felt like God was saying with him, you have never blown it. Blown it, you've blown it is not part of God's vocabulary. You see, now is not the time to give up. He's encouraging us, encouraging you to keep holding on, to keep trusting him. See, your breakthrough is coming. The land he promised you is still available for you to take. Be strong. Be courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. I will be with you. I will never leave you. I will give you every place where you set your foot. 
I want to speak over us life and hope again. Where promises appear to have broken, where, to, where breakthrough appears to have not have taken place or not taken place. I want to speak life back into those promises. I want to speak hope back into your life where, where, you've, bec- where you've begun to lose it, where you've begun to become despondent. I want to speak hope back into you. I want to speak the faithfulness of God over your life. The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. I want to encourage you to find a promise, a promise that he's given you. And keep that in your heart and keep reminding God of that promise. It's not that he's forgotten it. Be show him that you've not forgotten it. But let that promise anchor you into who he is. Let that promise anchor you in order that you find that breakthrough that you're looking for. Because that promise is your breakthrough. There is hope. There is hope. I got three areas that I thought would be good to respond to ministry, but there might there might be more. I think Jonathan, um, no, Sue and Steve. Uh, heading up the prayer ministry team. If you've already got a badge, then if you want to begin to make your way up so people know who where to come to. Jonathan, can you strum the guitar? Is that all right? I felt like God wanted to minister into three areas specifically. If you feel like that you've been doing it your way, and you've just got tired because it's just not working. Maybe you feel like you just want to give up because it's just been too long. The breakthrough just hasn't been coming. Maybe you feel like he's just forgotten his promises to you. If any of those three apply to you, can I encourage you, please do not leave this space without having received some prayer. Maybe you've lost hope. I'm going to add some more. Maybe you've lost hope. Come and get prayer in order that you can be full of hope again. I was the first person up last week to receive prayer. Because I needed, I needed to receive prayer and I felt so much better afterwards. I felt so much better afterwards. So if you're tired of doing it your way, if you feel like giving up, or if you feel like he's forgotten his promises to you, or you feel like there's just no hope, please, there's some lovely guys who just want to come and breathe hope and life back into your, into your situations. Amen.